Let's humbly come to you, Lord Father. I pray for the strength and courage to deliver your message today, Lord Father. Lord, I pray that it's your message that comes out and I don't get in the way, Lord Father. Lord, I pray that we can receive this message, Lord Father, with open hearts, Lord Father, that we can take something from it and learn from it. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being the Lord and Savior you are. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. In October of 1993, in the town of uh, Woochester, Massachusetts, police found an old woman dead on her kitchen floor. This was no ordinary discovery, though. She had been dead for four years. Police speculate she died at age 73 of natural causes. That's when her bank transactions ended. Now, how can someone be so cut off, cut off from relationships that no one would even notice when, or, when he or she dies? To some extent, it was a mistake, according to the Associated Press. Four years earlier, neighbors had called authorities when they sensed something might be wrong. When the police contacted the woman's brother, he said she had gone into a nursing home. Police told the Postal Service to stop delivering the mail. One, up, one neighbor paid her grandson to cut the grass because the place was looking run down. Another neighbor had the utility company come and shut off the water when a pipe from, froze, broke, and sent water spilling out the door. To a great extent, though, it was not a mistake. One friend, one friend from the past said she didn't want anyone bothering her at all. I guess she got her wish, but it's awfully sad. Her brother said the family hadn't been close since their mother died in 1979. He added, someone should have noticed something before now. The woman had lived in her house in the middle class neighborhood for 40 years, but none of her neighbors knew her well. My heart bleeds for her, said the woman who lives across the street. But you can't blame a soul. If she saw you out there, she never said hello to you or acknowledged you. As this neighborhood shows a spirit of community, it only results when all of us reach out to one another. So, the, you know, you read a story like that, and actually I read that story here a while back, and uh, I was like, it just, I couldn't let it go. I was like, that is crazy that something would happen like that. And then you start thinking about, well, what about that house down the road? You know, I never seen anybody there. A couple used to be there. What about this? You know, you start thinking about that. But how, how does this happen? So how does somebody get so withdrawn from society that they just kind of disappear? What makes a person get like that? You know, one, one, one thing we look at, we Christians believe in, believe in that there is good, there's God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then there's bad, the devil and his fallen angels, right? There's good versus bad constantly going on. And a lot of times what happens is called divide and conquer. The devil's main goals are to keep people from accepting Jesus Christ, number one, and if they have accepted him, he tries to get them to, to turn from him, to, to de start to deny him as their Lord and Savior so that they fall from grace. And there's many ways the devil tries to do this. I'm going to read you a quick little, I almost call it a poem, but it's actually scripture. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. I'm just glad I said Ecclesiastes is halfway correct. 
But that scripture of, of, of that section of scripture is titled "The Value of a Friend." The devil knows that if he can separate us, right, that you're a lot weaker. One on one, you're a lot weaker and easier to conquer. Now, during the early times of the church, during the early times of the Christian church, it was called the Way. But during a, during a lot that time, there was a lot of the Christians were heavily persecuted. And there was a group of them that faced terrible persecution. And it was from their fellow Jews. Because they would, and then a lot of them were starting to figure out that it might be a little easier just to kind of start denying Christ as the Messiah and kind of go back to the old ways. Because, man, we are getting persecuted by stuff stolen, our money. Nobody likes us. We're getting shunned. We can't go to these buildings. It's not good, right? So it was bad enough, it was bad enough that there was a, a letter written to them, to them to encourage them. Some of them were so, still immature in their faith. These were like second generation Christians. They weren't actually the ones that were like, you know, when Jesus was there, but it was their, the next generation. But they were seriously switching, or seriously considering switching back to Judaism. Life was easier that way. But like I said, there was a letter written to them to encourage them. If y'all want to turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'll give everybody a minute to get there. Or you can look on the screen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. It says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, all, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Just as it was tempting, it seemed easier to go back to, to Judaism for those early Christians it can be tempting for us to fall back in old ways, ways of the world, right? What's a temp typical human reaction when things get rough? We get, things get a little hard for us. First thing I usually do is I'm done with this. I, I'm, I'm no more. I'm done with this. You know, you can ask my daughter the first six months I was trying to deliver a message up here. A lot of Sundays, I'm, I'm not doing this no more. I'm done with this. That's hard, you know. And then you, might want, then you might be the kind of person that wants to avoid people. You've, you've, you've had a difficult situation. You've been accused of something or you filed bankruptcy or, or just something happened. And now you want to sit there and avoid people because you don't want to admit you messed up. Pride starts kicking in. Let me go back to my old ways. They seem a little easier. Let me go back to those vices that were easier to cope with life, right? The worst case scenario is you'll turn away from your beliefs. But these, these are some of the things the devil uses to try to start splitting you off from your group. When things get tough, we face persecution, hostility, and ill treatment. When it seems like our world is falling apart, nothing is going right, what should we do? Our human reaction is to leave but right here in verse 22, the first thing it says is, let us draw near. Draw closer to God, not further away. The first thing we need to do is draw closer to God. Remember that devil wants nothing more than to divide and conquer you. I had a period of time where I had, I had some... Serious accusations against me as a father. I mean, serious stuff. And all I wanted, I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. No more than I had to. And I became a recluse for a while. I wanted to withdraw. There's all kinds of people wanting to help me, but I wanted to withdraw. It's a natural human reaction. But that's when those thoughts start growing in that head. You know, that's when it starts growing. But then it says, let us draw near with true heart and full assurance of faith. 
with full assurance, it's with, with confidence or certainty of God Almighty's abilities. Let us draw near to God with confidence in our faith. Not doubt, but confidence. And then we look at verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So we want to hold fast. What does that mean? Does that mean like drive fast down the freeway? No, that means hold something tightly. Keep a firm grip on it. I guarantee you if Colton was outside right now and it was windy, he's going to hold Parker close. If he's in a group, you know, it's out in the fair, wherever there's thousands of people, he's going to hold them close, going to hold fast. Don't let it go. Don't let go of it. When things get hard, we need to hold fast. Then it says right here, verse 23, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Where we know our hope comes from, we, when we confess something, we're admitting something, right? So we've already admitted that we know Jesus Christ. We need to hold on to that. Hold on to what we already have, our faith. For he who promised is faithful. The one who promised is faithful. God Almighty has offered us a ticket to eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. When things get tough, we need to draw near, not far away. Hold fast in our beliefs. You know, here lately, I've been going through a, seasons, a season of time. You know, we all have different seasons of time. And it seems like something comes up, and here lately, I've been blessed enough by God that I've leaned more on Him when things are tough. And, it's, and it, I just keep getting amazed how much He's coming through for me. You know, I haven't got the million dollars so I can retire, you know, yet, but it's small things that come through. And it's like, and it just tells me how much was I lacking in my faith before? How much was I missing but not by truly leaning on Him, truly giving it to Him, truly believing that He's going to, to deliver for me. This was a letter of, uh, written, this was a letter written to a group of people that were all facing persecution. Not a single person, but this was everybody. This letter was addressed to a group. You know, we might even think of, of the, the uh, during World War II, the Jews as a group were being persecuted by the Nazis. This is kind of what this group of people were going on. It was, this letter was written to a group. So it wasn't just like an individual. But we can take this next verse and apply it to any of our fellow humans, not just Christians. You look at verse 24. It says, let us, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So if we consider, what are we doing if we consider? We're thinking about something very carefully, right? So what, what do we need to consider when we're thinking about one another? Are things going good or bad for them? If things are going good, compliment them. Hey, man, you, you guys are doing great. Hey, this is, you know, I don't know what your secret is, but y'all, you've got a great family. Compliment them, right? Learn from them maybe even. Or maybe you can ask, or see, since things are bad, you can realize they're going through trials or difficulties. Find out if there's something that, that you can do to help them. You don't have to be nosy or prying, but you can usually start figuring out there's something they can use a little bit of help with. You know, you ever had, had, had those people that, that um, the proper way to say this, difficult people to deal with, you know? Um... People that, you know, that whether it's people at work or, or business or just people you know or neighbors you know and people that fly off the handle or people that are just not that nice to, be, to deal with. And it seemed like forever, for the longest, I would pray to God, God, give me, give me the strength because I know the person I'm fixing to deal with is not the best person to deal with. I'm, I don't want to say any, any 
bad words or whatever. But, um, and I would pray, Lord, g- give me the strength to deal with them, to, to honor you through my actions. You know, don't let me get caught up in all that, you know, craziness, you know. And it seemed like more than anything here lately, when I pray that, instead of strength, I get understanding. You know, you get the person that flies off the handle. Or the person says, you know, if you don't do what I'm doing, I'm quitting. You know, they throw the threats out there. Or the person just blows up about everything, you know. But have have you ever considered what kind of turmoil is going on inside their head? Not... Knocking, talking bad or nothing, but something, what, what's causing them to act like that? It could be in, insecurity, lack of self esteem, maybe they're having terrible anxiety or panic attacks, uncertainty, uneasiness. But we need to think about that. A lot of times there's something going on with that person that makes them act like that. So we need to consider those things when we're out dealing with people. Let's, let's consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So we need to stir up love and good works. So what does it mean to stir up love? You know, there's a lot of metaphors of stir, you know. But you hear the person, oh, you're just stirring a pot. Somebody always causing trouble. Or I think of a um, buddy of mine, I used to uh, Used to be a good friend of mine. He was from Louisiana. Guy could cook great. And he'd cook gumbo and it'd be so good. And one day he's like, man, go stir that for me real quick. And I started stirring it and I think an eyeball come up and a claw and some kind of scold or something. I don't know what I was in there. and I didn't want to know. It was good though. But you stirred it and it brought everything up. It mixed it all around, right? Next time I closed my eyes though and stirred it. I mean... I don't know what was floating in there, but it, it was good, though, you know. But it's the same thing. We, we need to help bring that love to the top. Show, show that person that there is hope and understanding in the world. Most importantly, show them some love. Does Jesus not love us? And we go against his teachings every day. We do our best, but we're still going to sin at some point in time during the day. Maybe the people that that are so hard to get along with have not experienced much love. Maybe they are in a toxic environment, an unstable environment. We have to remember one thing. If they do not have the Holy Spirit in them, there's going to be a lot of doubt and uncertainty in their spirit. Doubt and uncertainty can lead to fear and anxiety. And that can short-circuit the brain, cause the lashing out, the temper, the tantrums, the etc. That's why we need to show a little bit of compassion sometimes. That's why we need to stir that pot and bring, bring the love to the top. Show them what there's some love in them. Bring the love out of them, right? Don't shun them. Don't push them away. Grab them out from those those depths of reclusion or whatever the proper word is. There's a theologian named John Robinson that wrote in a commentary. says, love needs stimulation in in society. Faith and hope can be practiced by a solitary person in a hermit's cell or on a desert island. But the exercise of love is possible only in a community setting. Love cannot be experienced in a solitary environment. That's why the devil wants to isolate you so bad. If he gets you away from the flock, the shepherd's not there to protect you because he knows love is powerful. That brings us to our last scripture. Let's look at verse 25. Not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together, as is, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So not forsaken. 
Don't take it for granted. Don't turn away from it. Don't abandon it. He is telling the Hebrews, don't turn from your beliefs for an easier life. Don't take it for granted. The easiest thing to do is take something like that for granted. Take a lot of things for granted. I'm going to get back to that one of these days. I I know, I know, yeah. Those folks made me mad at the church, and I'm going to get back to there one of these days. I went through the same thing after I got divorced. I thought they were shunning me, and actually I was the one pushing away from them. I'm going to find a different church. 20 years later, I found a different church. But don't take that kind of stuff for granted. Most importantly, don't turn your back on the group that loves you, the group that will support you. The definition of church is a group, a a body or group of religious followers. That's what it means to be the church. To gather together. To meet regularly. To sort out differences. Disagreements. Get them sorted out. To reach and encourage one another. To stir each other up. To keep the fire lit. To bring the love and encouragement to the top. Stoke that spiritual fire so that it does not become extinguished. This says to exhort, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. Exhorting is to uh, strongly encourage or urge somebody about something. You know, I had a person that that would tell me that they didn't need to go to church. And I was like, okay, why not? Well, I don't don't have to go to church to talk to God. I I can just go out in the woods and talk to God. Yeah, you can. You know, and I've been hearing a lot about this here lately. of People turning their back on the church, leaving the church, don't want nothing to do with the church, or the church as they call it. And it's because somebody has shunned them. Somebody has has uh, uh, made them mad. Somebody, there's been something was not handled right. But they'll have that view. I, I can go out. I can just do this by myself. One person, no, he, his beliefs come from his parents. I don't have to, we don't need to go to church. Like my dad says, I just go to the wood, out in the woods and talk to God. Yes, you can. But it's so much harder that way. That's why, that, that is why when we go, when we try and go at it alone, We miss out on so much. We all require encouragement. Encouragement is the greatest way we can help stoke somebody's spiritual fire. That is why the devil tries so hard. I know I keep uh, repeating myself, but I won't make my point. The devil tries so hard to split us apart because he knows we are more vulnerable when we don't have our support system. We are easy pickings. He splits you off, you're an easy pickings. You're an easy target. When we try to go it alone, we won't realize it, but we will start to distance ourselves from Jesus. We won't sit out on that course. We won't sit out to mean that. But we, when we go at it alone, we'll slowly start to distance ourselves from Jesus. We don't have an accountability system. We don't have an encouragement and we slowly get a, 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 a sucked into the world and further away from Jesus. When we meet together, it is, it is easier to be reminded of the truth and be taught the truth and not distance ourselves from Jesus Christ and to not abandon our beliefs as Christians. Now, in closing, I, I want to look at one more thing here. It's, it's on the same verse, so... Um, at the very end, it says, you know, I did not flip a single thing, did I? I just now realized, I'm sorry, I got it. I'm sorry, guys. I, good thing y'all weren't relying on the screen. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just, I guess y'all can tell how much I, this one's speaking. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't believe I did. I can't, I'm surprised Miss Ronnie didn't like, you know, nobody was like, uh, sorry about that, y'all. Verse 25, and at the very end it says, 
So much as you see the day approaching. So every, every generation of Christians talks about the end times, right? The end times are near. I, I, I haven't been a, I'm not a qualified Bible instructor or, or history. I, I, I'm the last one to ask about that. But it seems like even if you read about it in the Bible, they talk about the end times, the end times near. You know, I'm not like Revelation, but like right here. Even so, as you see the day approaching. But what, what you know, the end times are near. What, what can be a thousand years to us can be a glimpse to a finger to God. Just snap at the fingers like that. You know, if somebody was, if we were left, left church and we passed the pond, you see somebody drowning in that pond, would we go over, well, hey, ah, I'll get back to you, buddy. You know, hang in there. I'll, let me get back. I, I've got, I'm, I'm running late. If you're still there, when you get back, I'll get back. <laughs> or if they're drowning, would you go over there to save them? It's urgent when you see them drowning, right? So if we knew that tomorrow was going to be the last day on earth, for every, if somehow we had some inside information from God, tomorrow is happening. Rapture's happening, whatever, we're calling everybody up. Would you not be more in high gear of ministering to people, your loved ones and everybody else? Look, you've got to, you've got to hear me out. Hear me out. You're going to be a lot more, um, you're going to treat it with a lot more urgency. The end times are near. You would be working extra overtime. So we should treat every day as if it's the end times. It's the way I read this in the scripture. I still can't believe I didn't click at first. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. Uh, I guess. <laughs> we got out of practice we didn't have oh, that's what. There you go. That's what it was. Um, <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> just how you get into it. You get into it, I guess. But right. Um, I ask everybody to stand. Uh you know, I've just been hearing a lot about people. They don't. They 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 think they don't need the church anymore. They've turned away from church. They turned away from their beliefs. They they just somebody has offended them somehow. Somebody something's gone wrong. That just breaks my heart. And when I read that story about that woman that been dead for four years in her house and nobody knew, but you can understand how it could happen. But I just pray that we can have a, the servant's heart. We can be compassionate. We can be understanding with the people that, that, that we deal with. Try to have an understanding of why, why are they acting like this? What, what's causing them to um, act like this? What, what's causing them? What, how can I help them instead of asking for strength? Ask for understanding. How can I help them? What can I share with them? Maybe they just need a friend. But we need to treat every day as if it's the end times, as if we're running out of time. With our loved ones, definitely. That's the ones we want to start with the most, our closest ones, our neighbors, anybody we deal with. We need to treat it as if it's the, the end times. The times are, are getting close. We need to share, share the love of Jesus, share the, the, the gospel with them. There's a lot of turmoil going on in inside their head we need to show them there's some hope and there's some peace that they can have we just pray that that god will will direct us give us the courage to go face the person we don't want to to go to go deal with the people we don't want to to try to understand what they're going through we just pray that, that, that god will direct us we just pray that he'll give us the the abilities to have open arms for everybody and not have that persona that people want to stand off from but be the persona that people want to come to you they might come to you about their problems but we just lean on the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak to them we just pray that, that we can have guidance out in this world the light will always overpower the darkness and we want to be the light we just need to lean on Jesus
Amen. All right. Thank you. We got to work out a hand signal. Like, you know, no, I'm just kidding. That was, I was like, I was reading to look on my deal. Like, the verse ain't even there. What's going on? I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. It was. I, I, I was sorry. I was. I was something that was been waiting for a while. That's right. <laughs> right. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's close out our service, y'all. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. All right.